Next question. Thank you. I'm Kimberly Camp, and my question is about what percentage of the CO2 um, that we're talking about comes from driving versus related petroleum manufacture and industry? And if the percentage is such that it impacts the health and well-being of humans, species on the plan, planet, energy savings by turning out lights early rather than later, why wouldn't we do it? Mike, I think that might be a question directly for you. Well, I think we do do it. Uh, I don't think we willfully run around leaving the lights on in a house. I, I certainly no, I don't. I, I try to buy energy efficient cars as best as I can, given my need for transporting grandkids and so forth. I'll tell you one thing about gasoline that just infuriates me is that this business of putting ethanol in the gasoline is, is maddening because anyone here know what Perry's Handbook of Chemical Engineering looks like? All you have to do is look up the energy content called energy density and you'll find that ethanol has 77,000 BTUs per gallon and gasoline is about 116. A gallon of ethanol contains only two-thirds of the energy that a gallon of gasoline does. And there I am in Ellensburg trying to work my way to Seattle and they're making me buy ethanol. And we're making them buy ethanol because some hand-wringing greenie uh, <laughs> Uh, one of the most articulate spokesmen in all of the world on global warming is a guy by the name of uh, Christopher Moncton. Please Google his name. But he referred to these guys as uh, Birkenstock bedwetters about two weeks ago. So, uh, but I think it should be market driven. I, I do not want a big government telling me what I can drive, where I can drive, and how far I can drive. You may, you may not know this, but in, in House Bill 2815, which is recently signed in law, it's not even deb debated anymore, it's law, where they are going to be limiting MVT, miles per vehicle traveled. They're trying to set up a system where we can only travel 2,500 miles per year per car. 2,500. Think of that. Chuck, I don't know which of us wants to follow that. I think it probably should be you. I, I, I forget what the original question was. <laughs> Energy efficiency. Ah. <coughs> I, 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 I must confess I don't know those percentages off the top of my head. Um, but... Uh, as a scientist, we're, we're taught to try and think on our feet, so let me try and think. Well, I guess I'll have to stand up then. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I, I do much better thinking uh, when contact is in other areas of my body. But um, I mean, all you have to do is walk outside, stand around on these streets, and look at all the vehicle traffic that's just going around our area here. So certainly a significant amount is coming out of there, among other things. I mean, it's not just carbon dioxide. It comes out the tailpipes. But uh, we do not live in a heavy industrial area here. Now, I originally came from Pennsylvania, and you have Pittsburgh. That is a heavy industrial area. And uh, I can assure you a lot of this comes out of those smokestacks, too. But I couldn't give you a possible breakdown right now. I don't know that off the top of my head, so I'm not going to guess. Um, but uh, I, I do have to take issue with this claim that only 3% of the current CO2 uh, is coming from man's uh, activities. I, I just don't see how that could possibly be when 100 years ago we had 270 parts per million and now we have 370 parts per million and as far as I can t where did the other 90 parts per million come from from what natural source? I just I'm puzzled by that. You want to make a quick comment? Yes. He, he hit upon another area where the, where the absolute data are the flimsiest that you'll ever find. I, I've been in email contact with a guy by the name of Georg Beck, who's a, a German, who has put together a huge compilation of CO2 measurements in the last 150 years. 
What's happened is that a guy by the name of Keeling put together, uh, along, along with the Mauna Loa CO2 monitoring station, put together data to extrapolate nice and smooth and wonderful appealing curve that goes down into the 1890s, 1860s. What, how Keeling did this, because Georg Beck has dug up the information, Ge Keeling et al. have ignored 90,000 measurements, direct measurements of CO2. And well, some and the early measurements of CO2 were higher than they are now. We need to move uh, rather uh, quickly. I have two more questions from the floor. Chuck, uh, you're entitled to a re rebuttal if you wish. Uh, yeah, you got to be a little bit careful here because uh, those uh, 90,000 measurements that are claimed to be ignored here um, the Mauna Loa measurements are made high in the atmosphere, in the free atmosphere. And the reason they're made up there is because by the time you get up there, you're getting away from, uh, from the source, which is at the surface. And so it has, has been well mixed in the atmosphere. And so you can get a number that does represent something uh, uh, that, uh, that encompasses a very, very wide area that way. But John. to make uh, measurements at the surface, you really have to be very careful about the very local production influences on, the, on that. And if you really look into this, there are good valid scientific reasons for the way these things are done. John? Uh, yes, I have two um, understandings that I'd like to either get clarified or uh, vilified, if you will. I understand that in the original uh, production of the IPCC report, there were uh, roughly 55 atmospheric scientists or scientists that were involved in the science parts of that. I understand that their findings were turned into the IPCC, that they were then turned over to two people who were not scientists, they were two political scientists. A lot of that information was written to the former uh, understanding, and a number of those scientists that were involved quit in, in, with furor over that. The second one is I understand that if you take the, the given models today and you go back 100 years and you input the data from 100 years ago, that they cannot even begin to accurately predict what we know the, the, uh, with that input, what the atmospheric conditions are now. Chuck, I think that was directed for you. I, I, he was looking at me the whole time, yes. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, here is, where, here is where you have to differentiate between where the job of the scientist ends and others take over. Uh, it's obvious here that there is politics and agendas involved in this whole discussion. I mean, this is part of the public discourse. The job of the scientist, those original 55, was to report what they saw, what they knew, what they had at that point been able to determine. Yes, after that, it's out of our hands. Okay, I'm not gonna, I am not gonna set up here and take responsibility for anything in the IPCC report personally. The only thing I can do is give you my professional expert judgment on what's good and what's likely, you know, bad about it. That's all, that's all as a scientist I can do. That's why I stopped where I did. I'm not getting into politics. I'm not, I have no political agenda here. My job is to tell you what I know uh, in my field of expertise. That's what I, and your, your second point, I... The flaws in the modeling that they can't predict known conditions and known data. Well, I would take exception to that. I mean, uh, we are improving our models. The program I work for, the Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Program, its overarching goal is to continue to improve our global climate models. They're not perfect, but I would take exception to a statement that if you input the conditions a hundred years ago, they can't even get in with the ballpark of current conditions. That's, that's not right. Uh, I, I work very closely with mod people who do this kind of modeling. And uh, you know, I don't see Steve here, uh, but anyway, uh, I know that statement is, well, highly exaggerated. Mike? 